Final Division of Roman Empire, The Disruptive Intrigues, 8395 by J.B. Burry, Part 1. When Theodosius I, surnamed the Great, was elevated to power as ruler of the East, that part of the empire was distracted in consequence of wars with the Visigoths, who, flying from the Huns, had been granted a refuge in the Roman provinces of Mercia and Thrace. Ill treatment by the Romans drove the Visigoths to revolt, and Valens, then emperor of the East, set out with an army to punish them. In the Battle of Adrianople, August 9, 378, the Roman army was defeated, and in the retreat Valens was killed. The Visigoths pressed on, ravaging the country even to the foot of the walls of Constantinople, and the doom of the empire seemed to be at hand. At this juncture Gratian, Emperor of the West, who also upon the death of Valens succeeded him as ruler of the East, sent for Theodosius, then a Roman general living in retirement in Spain, made him his colleague in the East and placed him, AD 379, at the head of an army for the suppression of the Gothic outbreaks. Theodosius enabled his soldiers to regain their lost confidence by waging a successful guerrilla war with the marauding Goths, but having thus shown his mastery over their straggling bands, he did not undertake to drive them out from Roman territory, but weakened them by causing them to quarrel among themselves. Then, showing himself as their friend, he gave them lands and settled them within definite limits. To the Visigoths, or West Goths, he gave Thrace, and to the Ostrogoths, or East Goths, who had also now poured into the Roman provinces, he assigned Pannonia. By this policy, Theodosius established his authority in the East and restored the empire to something of its earlier power. Except during the last four months of his life, when he was sole emperor, his direct authority was confined to the East, but he exerted a potent influence upon the affairs of the whole empire, both temporal and spiritual. He warred steadily against paganism and heresy. He took the side of Trinitarian orthodoxy against Arianism, which had previously triumphed in the East, and restored religious unity to the empire by making the Athanasian doctrine the faith of Constantinople, as it was that of the West. This policy was ratified by the Second Ecumenical Council, called by Theodosius at Constantinople in 381, when the orthodoxy first promulgated by the Council of Nicaea in 325 was substantially reaffirmed. It was also largely through the influence of Theodosius, who was the friend of Ambrose, Archbishop of Milan, that the Roman Senate, by a great majority, voted, 388, to abolish the worship of Jupiter and to adopt the worship of Christ, thus making Christianity the state religion. In the debate which preceded this transition, the eloquence of Symmachus, on the pagan side, was overmatched by the arguments of Ambrose, aided by the powerful support of Theodosius in person. In his further dealings with the Visigoths, Theodosius, following a precedent already established, enlisted in the Roman service a separate Gothic army of 40,000 soldiers, but this policy, as the event proved, was fatal to the permanency of his hitherto successful control of these alien elements, for they soon gathered strength to take the mastery into their own hands. Theodosius died in 395, after publishing a decree for partition of the empire between his two sons, Honorius to rule in the west, and Arcadius in the east. He meant not to establish two independent jurisdictions, but that there should be one commonwealth, whose two rulers should be colleagues and coadjutors in its defence. This new disposition of the empire was followed by dissensions and intrigues against which the weak sons of Theodosius were helpless in the hands of able and unscrupulous self-seekers, the result of which was the final separation of the empire into two distinct governments, and the weakening of the powers of resistance of both against those ever-increasing encroachments of the barbarians which eventually caused the fall of both empires. One of the few men in history who have won the title of great, the Emperor Theodosius I, who had by his policy, at once friendly and firm, pacified the Goths, who had confirmed the triumph of Athanasian over Arian Christianity, who had stamped out the last frames of refractory paganism represented by the tyrant Eugenius, died on the 17th of January, AD 395. His wishes were that his younger son, Honorius, then a boy of ten years, should reign in the west, where he had already installed him, and that his eldest son, Arcadius, whom he had left as regent in Constantinople when he set out against Eugenius, should continue to reign in the east. But he was not willing to leave his youthful heirs. Arcadius was only eighteen, without a protector, and the most natural protector was one bound to them by ties of relationship. Accordingly, on his deathbed, he commended them to the care of the Vandal Stilico, whom he had raised for his military and other talents to the rank of commander-in-chief, and, deeming him worthy of an alliance with his own family, had united to his favourite niece Serena. We can hardly doubt that it was in this capacity, as the husband of his niece and a trusted friend, not as a general, that Stilico received Theodosius's dying wishes. It was as an elder member of the same family that the husband of their cousin could claim to exert an influence over Arcadius and Honorius, of whom, however, the latter, it would appear, was more especially committed to his care, not only as the younger, but because Stilico, 
being magister militum of the armies of Italy, would come more directly into contact with him than with his brother. Arcadius, with whom we are especially concerned, was about eighteen at the time of his father's death. He was of short stature, of dark complexion, thin and inactive, and the dullness of his wit was betrayed by his speech and by his eyes, which always seemed as if they were about to close in sleep. His smallness of intellect and his weakness of character made it inevitable that he should come under the influence, good or bad, of commanding personalities with which he might be brought in contact. Such a potent personality was the Praetorian prefect Rufinus, a native of Aquitaine, who in almost every respect presented a contrast to his sovereign. He was tall and manly, and the restless movements of his keen eyes and the readiness of his speech signified his intellectual powers. He was a strong, worldly man, ambitious of power, and sufficiently unprincipled. Avaricious, too, like most ministers of the age. He had made many enemies by acts which were perhaps somewhat more than usually unscrupulous, but we cannot justly assume that in the overthrow of certain rivals he was entirely guilty and they entirely innocent, as is sometimes represented. It is almost certain that he formed the scheme and cherished the hope of becoming joint emperor with Arcadius. This ambition of Rufinus placed him at once in an attitude of opposition to Stilicho, who was himself not above the suspicion of entertaining similar schemes, not, however, in the interest of his own person, but for his son Eucarius. The position of the Vandal, who is connected by marriage with the imperial family, gave him an advantage over Rufinus, which was strengthened by the generally known fact that Theodosius had given him his last instructions. Stilicho, moreover, was popular with the army, and for the present the great bulk of the forces of the empire was at his disposal, for the regiments united to suppress Eugenius had not yet been sent back to their various stations. Thus a struggle was imminent between the ambitious minister who had the ear of Arcadius, and the strong general who held the command and enjoyed the favour of the army. Before the end of the year the struggle began and concluded in an extremely curious way, but we must first relate how a certain scheme of Rufinus had been checkmated by an obscurer but wilier rival nearer at hand. It was the cherished project of Rufinus to unite Arcadius with his only daughter. Once the emperor's father-in-law, he might hope to become speedily an emperor himself. But he imprudently made a journey to Antioch, in order to execute vengeance personally on the Count of the East, who had offended him, and during his absence from Byzantium an adversary stole a march on him. This adversary was the eunuch Eutropius, the Lord Chamberlain, a bald old man, who with oriental craftiness had won his way up from the meanest services and employments. Determining that the future empress should be bound to himself and not to Rufinus, he chose Eudoxia, a girl of singular beauty, the daughter of a distinguished Frank, but herself of Roman education. Her father, Bauto, was dead, and she lived in the house of the widow and sons of one of the victims of Rufinus. Eutropius showed a picture of the Frank maiden to the emperor, and engaged his affections for her. The nuptials were arranged by the time Rufinus returned to Constantinople, and were speedily celebrated, April 27, 395. This was a blow to Rufinus, but he was still the most powerful man in the East. The event which at length brought him into contact with Stilicho was the rising of the Visigoths, who had been settled by Theodosius in Mesia and Thrace, and were bound in return for their lands to serve in the army as Federati. They had accompanied the emperor to Italy against Eugenius, and had returned to their habitation sooner than the rest of the army. The causes of discontent which led to their revolt are not quite clear, but it seems that Arcadius refused to give them certain grants of money which had been allowed them by his father, and, as has been suggested, they probably expected that favour would wane and influence decrease now that the friend of the Goths was dead, and consequently determined to make themselves heard and felt. To this must be added that their most influential chieftain Alaric, called Baltha the Bold, desired to be made a commander-in-chief, Magister Militum, and was offended that he had been passed over. However this may be, the historical essence of the matter is that an immense body of restless, uncivilised Germans could not abide permanently in the centre of Roman provinces in a semi-dependent, ill-defined relation to the Roman government. The West Goths had not yet found their permanent home. Under the leadership of Alaric, they raised the ensign of revolt and spread desolation in the fields and homesteads of Macedonia, Messia, and Thrace, even advancing close to the walls of Constantinople. They carefully spared certain estates outside the city, belonging to the prefect Rufinus, but this policy does not seem to have been adopted with the same motive that caused Archidamus to spare the lands of Pericles. Alaric may have wished not to render Rufinus suspected, but to conciliate his friendship and obtain thereby more favourable terms. Rufinus actually went to Alaric's camp, dressed as a Goth, but the interview led to nothing. It was impossible to take the field against the Goths because there were no forces available, as the eastern armies were still with Stilicho in the west. Arcadius, therefore, was obliged to summon Stilicho, to send or bring them back immediately to protect his throne. 
This summons gave that general the desired opportunity to interfere in the politics of Constantinople, and having with energetic celerity arranged matters on the Gallic frontier, he marched overland through Illyricum and confronted Alaric in Thessaly, whither the Goth had traced his devastating path from the Propontis. It appears that Stilicho's behaviour is quite as open to the charges of ambition and artfulness as the behaviour of Rufinus, for I do not perceive how we can strictly justify his detention of the forces, which ought to have been sent back to defend the provinces of Arcadius at the very beginning of the year. Stilicho's march to Thessaly can scarcely have taken place before October, and it is hard to interpret this long delay in sending back the troops, over which he had no rightful authority, if it were not dictated by a wish to implicate the government of New Rome in difficulties and render his own intervention necessary. We are told, too, that he selected the best soldiers from the Eastern regiments and enrolled them in the Western Corps. If we adopted the Cassian maxim, qui bono fuerit, we should be inclined to accuse Stilicho of having been privy to the revolt of Alaric. Such a supposition would at least be far more plausible than the calumny which was circulated, charging Rufinus with having stirred up the Visigoths. For such a supposition, too, we might find support in the circumstance that the estates of Rufinus were spared by the soldiers of Alaric. It would be intelligible that Stilicho suggested the plan in order to bring odium upon Rufinus. To such a conjecture, finally, certain other circumstances soon to be related point, but it remains nothing more than a suspicion. It seems that before Stilicho arrived, Alaric had experienced a defeat at the hands of garrison soldiers in Thessaly. At all events, he shut himself up in a fortified camp and declined to engage with the Roman general. In the meantime, Rufinus induced Arcadius to send a peremptory order to Stilicho to dispatch the eastern troops to Constantinople and depart himself whence he had come. The emperor resented, or pretended to resent, the presence of his cousin as an officious interference. Stilicho yielded so readily that his willingness seems almost suspicious, but we shall probably never know whether he was responsible for the events that followed. He consigned the eastern soldiers to the command of a Gothic captain, Gainus, and himself departed to Salona, allowing Alaric to proceed on his wasting way into the lands of Hellas. Gainus and his soldiers marched by the Via Ignatia to Constantinople, and it was arranged that, according to a usual custom, the emperor and his court should come forth from the city to meet the army in the Campus Martius, which extended on the west side of the city near the Golden Gate. We cannot trust the statement of a hostile writer that Rufinus actually expected to be created Augustus on this occasion, and appeared at the emperor's side prouder and more sumptuously arrayed than ever. We only know that he accompanied Arcadius to meet the army. It is said that, when the emperor had saluted the troops, Rufinus advanced, and displayed a studied affability and solicitude to please, toward even individual soldiers. They closed in round him as he smiled and talked, anxious to secure their goodwill for his elevation to the throne, but just as he felt himself very nigh to supreme success, the swords of the nearest were drawn, and his body, pierced with wounds, fell to the ground. His head, carried through the streets, was mocked by the people, and his right hand, severed from the trunk, was presented at the doors of houses with the request, Give to the insatiable. We can hardly suppose that the lynching of Rufinus was the fatal inspiration of a moment, but whether it was proposed or approved of by Stilicho, or was a plan hatched among the soldiers on their way to Constantinople, is uncertain. One might even conjecture that the whole affair was the result of a pre-arrangement between Stilicho and the party in Byzantium, which was adverse to Rufinus and led by the eunuch Eutropius, but there is no evidence. Our knowledge of this scene unfortunately depends on a partial and untrustworthy writer, who, moreover, wrote in verse, the poet Claudian. He enjoyed the patronage of Stilicho, and his poems Against Rufinus, Against Eutropius, and On the Gothic War are a glorification of his patron's splendid virtues. Stilicho and Rufinus he paints as two opposite forces, the force of good and the force of evil, like the principles of the Manichaeans. Rufinus is the terrible Pytho, the scourge of the world. Stilicho is the radiant Apollo, the deliverer of mankind. Rufinus is the power of darkness, whose Tartarian wickedness surpasses even the wickedness of the furies of hell. Stilicho is an angel of light. In the works of a poet whose leading idea was so extravagant, we can hardly expect to find much fair historical truth. It is, as a rule, only accidental references and allusions that we can accept, unless other authorities confirm his statements. Yet even modern writers, who know well how cautiously Claudian must be used, have been unconsciously prejudiced in favour of Stilicho and against Rufinus. We must return to the movements of Alaric, who had entered the regions of classical Greece, for which he showed scant respect. The commander of the garrison at Thermopylae, and the proconsul of Achaea, offered no resistance, and the West Goths entered Boeotia, where Thebes alone escaped their devastation. They occupied the Piraeus, but Athens itself was spared, and Alaric was entertained as a guest in the city of Athene. But the great temple of the mystic goddesses Demeter and Persephone, at Eleusius, was burned down by the reverend barbarians. Megara, the next place on their southward route, fell, then Corinth, 
Argos, and Sparta. But when they reached Elis, they were confronted by an unexpected opponent. Stilico had returned from Italy, by way of Salona, which he reached by sea to stay the hand of the invader. He blockaded him in the plain of Fole, but for some reason, not easily comprehensible, he did not press his advantage, and set free the hordes of the Visigothic land pirates to resume their career of devastation. He went back to Italy, and Alaric returned, plundering as he went, to Illyricum and Thrace, where he made terms with the government of New Rome, and received the desired title of Magister Militum per Illyricum. No one will suppose that Stilico went all the way from Italy to the Peloponnesus, and then, although he had Alaric practically at his mercy, retreated, leaving matters just as they were without some excellent reason. If he had genuinely wished to deliver the distressed countries and assist the Emperor Arcadius, he would not have acted in this ineffectual manner, as it is difficult to see that his conduct is explained by assuming that he was not willing, by a complete extermination of the Goths, to enable Arcadius to dispense with his help in future. In that case, what did he gain by going to the Peloponnesus at all? Or we might ask, if he wished Arcadius to summon his assistance from year to year, is it likely that he would have adopted the method of rendering no assistance whatever? But above all, the question occurs, what pleasure would it have been to the general to look forward to being called upon again and again to take the field against the Visigoths? It seems evident that Stilico and Alaric made at Foley some secret and definite arrangement which conditioned Stilico's departure, and that this arrangement was conducive to the interests of Stilico, who was in the position of advantage, and at the same time not contrary to the interests of Alaric, for otherwise Stilico could not have been sure that the agreement would be carried out. What this secret compact was can only be a matter of conjecture, but I would suggest that Stilico had already formed the plan of creating his son Eucarius Emperor, and that he designed the Balkan Peninsula to be the dominion over which Eucarius should hold sway. His conduct becomes perfectly explicable if we assume that by a secret agreement he secured Alaric's assistance for the execution of this scheme, which the preponderance of Gothic power in Illyricum and Thrace would facilitate. End of section 37《Final Division of Roman Empire – The Disruptive Intrigues, 8395 by J. B. Burry, Part 2 It was not only the European parts of Arcadius's dominions that were ravaged in 395 by the fire and sword of barbarians. In the same year, hordes of Transcaucasian Huns poured through the Caspian Gates and, rushing southward through the provinces of Mesopotamia, carried desolation into Syria. St. Jerome was in Palestine at this time, and in two of his letters we have the account of an eyewitness. As I was searching for an abode worthy of such a lady, Fabiola, his friend. Behold, suddenly messengers rush hither and thither, and the whole east trembles with the news that from the far Maeotis, from the land of the ice-bound Don and the savage Massagetai, where the strong works of Alexander on the Caucasian cliffs keep back the wild nations, swarms of Huns had burst forth, and, flying hither and thither, were scattering slaughter and terror everywhere. The Roman army was at that time absent in consequence of the civil wars in Italy. May Jesus protect the Roman world in future from such beasts, they were everywhere, when they were least expected, and their speed outstripped the rumour of their approach. They spared neither religion nor dignity nor age. They showed no pity to the cry of infancy. Babes, who had not yet begun to live, were forced to die, and, ignorant of the evil that was upon them, as they were held in the hands and threatened by the swords of the enemy, there was a smile upon their lips. There was a consistent and universal report that Jerusalem was the goal of the foes, and that on account of their insatiable lust for gold they were hastening to this city. The walls, neglected by the carelessness of peace, were repaired. Antioch was enduring a blockade. Tyre, fain to break off from the dry land, sought its ancient island. Then we too were constrained to provide ships, to stay on the seashore, to take precautions against the arrival of the enemy, and, though the winds were wild, to fear a shipwreck less than the barbarians, making provision not for our own safety so much as for the chastity of our virgins. In another letter, speaking of these wolves of the north, he says, how many monasteries were captured, the waters of how many rivers were stained with human gore, Antioch was besieged and the other cities, past which the Halys, the Kidnus, the Orontes, the Euphrates flow. Herds of captives were dragged away, Arabia, Phoenicia, Palestine, Egypt were led captive by fear. The Huns, however, were not the only depredators at whose hands the provinces of Asia Minor and Syria suffered. There were other enemies within, whose ravages were constant, while the expedition of the Huns from without occurred only once. These enemies were the freebooters who dwelt in the Isaurian mountains, wild and untamed in their secure fastnesses. Ammianus Marcellinus describes picturesquely the habits of these sturdy robbers. They used to descend from the difficult mountain slopes like a whirlwind to places on the seashore, where in hidden ways and glens they lurked till the fall of night, and in the light of the crescent moon watched until the mariners riding at anchor slept. Then they boarded the vessels, 
killed and plundered the crews, whilst the coast of Isario was like a deadly shore of Skiron. It was avoided by sailors, who made a practice of putting in at the safer ports of Cyprus. The Isaurians did not always confine their land expeditions to the surrounding provinces of Cilicia and Pamphylia. They penetrated, in AD 403, northward to Cappadocia and Pontus, or southward to Syria and Palestine, and the whole range of the Taurus, as far as the confines of Syria, seemed to have been their spacious habitation. An officer named Arbicasius was entrusted by Arcadius with an office similar in object to that which, four and a half centuries ago, had been assigned to Pompeius, but... Though he quelled the spirits of the freebooters for a moment, Arbicasius did not succeed in eradicating the lawless element, in the same way as Pompeius had succeeded in exterminating the piracy which in his day infested the same regions. In the years 404 and 405, Cappadocia was overrun by the robber bands. Meanwhile, after the death of Rufinus, the weak emperor Arcadius passed under the influence of the eunuch Eutropius, who, in unscrupulous greed of money, resembled Rufinus and many other officials of the time, and, like Rufinus, has been painted far blacker than he really was. All the evil things that were said by his enemies of Rufinus were said of Eutropius by his enemies, but in reading of the enormities of the latter we must make great allowance for the general prejudice existing against a person with Eutropius's physical disqualifications. Eutropius naturally looked on the Praetorian prefects, the most powerful men in the administration next to the emperor, with jealousy and suspicion as dangerous rivals. It was his interest to reduce their power and to raise the dignity of his own office to an equality with theirs. To his influence, then, we are probably justified in ascribing two innovations which were made by Arcadius. The administration of the Cursus Publicus, or Office of Postmaster General, was transferred from the Praetorian Prefects to the Master of Offices, and the same transference was made in regard to the manufactories of arms. On the other hand, the Grand Chamberlain, Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi, was made an illustris, equal in rank to the Praetorian prefects. Both these innovations were afterward altered. The general historical import of the position of Eutropius is that the empire was falling into a danger, by which it had been threatened from the outset, and which it had been ever trying to avoid. We may say that there were two dangers, which constantly impended over the Roman Empire from its inauguration by Augustus to its redintegration by Diocletian, a Scylla and Charybdis, between which it had to steer. The one was a cabinet of imperial freedmen, the other was a military despotism. The former danger called forth, and was counteracted by, the creation of a civil service system, to which Hadrian perhaps made the most important contributions, and which was finally elaborated by Diocletian, who at the same time averted the other danger by separating the military and civil administrations. But both dangers revived in a new form. The danger from the army became danger from the Germans, who preponderated in it, and the institution of court ceremonial tended to create a cabinet of chamberlains and imperial dependents. This oriental ceremonial, so marked a feature of late Byzantinism, involved, as one of its principles, difficulty of access to the emperor, who, living in the retirement of his palace, was tempted to trust less to his eyes than his ears, and saw too little of public affairs. Diocletian appreciated this disadvantage himself, and remarked that the sovereign, shut up in his palace, cannot know the truth, but must rely on what his attendants and officers tell him. We may also remark that absolute monarchy, by its very nature, tends in this direction, for absolute monarchy naturally tends to a dynasty, and a dynasty implies that there must sooner or later come to the throne weak men, inexperienced in public affairs, reared up in an atmosphere of flattering delusion, easily guided by intriguing chamberlains and eunuchs. Under such conditions, then, all at cabals and chamber cabinets are sure to become dominant sometimes. Diocletian, whose political insight and ingenuity were remarkable, tried to avoid the dangers of a dynasty by his artificial system, but artifice could not contend with success against nature. The greatest blot in the ministry of Eutropius, for, as he was the most trusted adviser of the emperor, we may use the word ministry, was the sale of offices, of which Claudian gives a vivid and exaggerated account. This was a blot, however, that stained other men of those days as well as Eutropius, and we must view it rather as a feature of the times than as a personal enormity. Of course, the eunuch spies were ubiquitous. Of course, informers of all sorts were encouraged and rewarded. All the usual stratagems for grasping and plundering were put into practice. The strong measures that a determined minister was ready to take for the mere sake of vengeance may be exemplified by a treatment which the whole Lycian province received at the hands of Rufinus. On account of a single individual, Tassian, who defended that minister, all the provincials were excluded from public offices. After the death of Rufinus, the Lycians were relieved from these disabilities, but the fact that the Edict of Emancipation expressly enjoins that no one henceforward venture to wound a Lycian citizen with the name of scorn shows what a serious misfortune their degradation was.
the eunuch won considerable odium in the first year of his power, 396, by bringing about the fall of two men of distinction, Abundantius, to whose patronage he owed his rise in the world, and Tomasius, who had been the commander-general in the east. An account of the manner in which the ruin of the latter was wrought will illustrate the sort of intrigues that were spun into the Byzantine court. Tomasius had brought with him from Sardis a Syrian sausage-seller named Bargus, who, with native address, had insinuated himself into his good graces and obtained a subordinate command in the army. The prying omniscience of Eutropius discovered that, years before, this same Bargus had been forbidden to enter Constantinople for some misdemeanour. By means of this knowledge he gained an ascendancy over the Syrian, and compelled him to accuse his benefactor, Tomasius, of a treasonable conspiracy, supporting the charge by forgeries. The accused was tried, condemned, and banished to the Libyan oasis, a punishment equivalent to death, he was never heard of more. Eutropius, foreseeing that the continued existence of Bargus might at some time compromise himself, suborned his wife to lodge very serious charges against her husband, in consequence of which he was put to death. Whether Eutropius then got rid of the wife, we are not informed. Among the adherents of Eutropius, who were equally numerous and insincere, two were of especial importance. Osseus, who had risen from the post of a cook to be count of the sacred largesses, and finally master of the offices, and Leo, a soldier, corpulent and good-humoured, who was known by the sobriquet of Ajax, a man of great body and little mind, fond of boasting, fond of eating, fond of drinking, and fond of women. On the other hand, Eutropius had many enemies, and enemies in two different quarters. Romans of the stamp of Tomasius and Aurelian were naturally opposed to the supremacy of an emasculated chamberlain. As we shall see subsequently, the German element in the empire, represented by Gainus, was also inimical, and it seems certain that a serious confederacy was formed in the year 397, aiming at the overthrow of Eutropius. Though this is not stated by any writer, it seems an inevitable conclusion from the law which was passed in the autumn of that year, assessing the penalty of death to anyone who had conspired with soldiers or private persons, including barbarians, against the lives of illustres who belonged to our consistory or assisted our councils, or other senators, such a conspiracy being considered equivalent to treason. Intent was to be regarded as equivalent to crime, and not only did the individual concerned incur capital punishment, but his descendants were visited with disfranchisement. It is generally recognised that this law was an express palladium for chamberlains, but surely it must have been suggested by some actually formed conspiracy, of which Eutropius discovered the threads before it was carried out. The particular mention of soldiers and barbarians points to a particular danger, and we may suspect that Gainus, who afterward brought about the fall of Eutropius, had some connection with it. While the eunuch was sailing in the full current of success at Byzantium, the Vandal Stilico was enjoying an uninterrupted course of prosperity in the somewhat less stifling air of Italy. The poet Claudian, who acted as a sort of poet laureate to Honorius, was really an apologist for Stilico, who patronised and paid him. Almost every public poem he produced is an extravagant panegyric on that general, and we cannot but suspect that many of his utterances were direct manifestos suggested by his patron. In the panegyric in honour of the third consulate of Honorius, 396, which, composed soon after the death of Rufinus, breathes a spirit of concord between East and West, the writer calls upon Stilico to protect with his right hand the two brothers, Geminus de extra tu protege fratres. Such lines as this are written to put a certain significance on Stilico's policy, and the panegyric in honour of the fourth consulate of Honorius, 398, he gives an absolutely false and misleading account of Stilico's expedition to Greece two years before, an account which no allowance for poetical exaggeration can defend. At the same time he extols Honorius with the most absurd eulogiums, and overwhelms him with the most extravagant adulations, making out the boy of fourteen to be greater than his father and grandfather. If Claudian were not a poet, we should say that he was a most outrageous liar. We are therefore unable to accord him the smallest credit when he boasts that the subjects in the western provinces are not oppressed by heavy taxes, and that the treasury is not replenished by extortion. Stilico and Eutropius had shaken hands over the death of Rufinus, but the good understanding was not destined to last longer than the Song of Triumph. We cannot justly blame Eutropius for this. No minister of Arcadius could regard with goodwill or indifference the desire of Stilico to interfere in the affairs of New Rome, for this desire cannot be denied. Even if one do not accept the theory that the scheme of detaching Illyricum from Arcadius' dominion was entertained by him at his early date as 396, his position of master of soldier in Italy gave him no power in other parts of the empire, and the attitude which he assumed as an elderly relative, solicitously concerned for the welfare of his wife's young cousin, in obedience to the wishes of that cousin's father, was untenable when it led him to exceed the acts of a strictly private friendship. 
we can then well understand the indignation felt at New Rome, not only by Eutropius, but probably also by men of a quite different faction when the news arrived that Stilicho purposed to visit Constantinople to set things in order, and arrange matters for Arcadius. Such officiousness was intolerable, and it was plain that the strongest protests must be made against it. The Senate accordingly passed a resolution declaring Stilicho a public enemy. This action of the Senate is very remarkable, and its signification is not generally perceived. If the act had been altogether due to Eutropius, it would surely have taken the form of an imperial decree. Eutropius would not have resorted to the troublesome method of bribing or threatening the whole Senate, even if he had been able to do so. We must conclude, then, that the general feeling against Stilicho was strong, and we must confess naturally strong. The situation was now complicated by a revolt in Africa, which eventually proved highly fortunate for the glory and influence of Stilicho. Eighteen years before, the Moor of Firmus had made an attempt to create a kingdom for himself in the African provinces, AD 379, and had been quelled by the arms of Theodosius, who received important assistance from Gildo, the brother and enemy of Firmus. Gildo was duly rewarded. He was finally military commander, or count, of Africa, and his daughter Silvina was united in marriage to a nephew of the Empress, Aelia Flacilla. But the faith of the Moors was as the faith of the Carthaginians. Gildo refused to send aid to Theodosius in his expedition against Eugenius. After Theodosius's death, he prepared to take a more positive attitude, and he engaged numerous African nomad tribes to support him in his revolt. The strange relations between old and new Rome, which did not escape his notice, suggested to him that his rebellion might assume the form of a transition from the sovereignty of Honorius to the sovereignty of Arcadius. He knew that if he were dependent only on new Rome, he would be practically independent. He entered accordingly into communication with the government of Arcadius, but the negotiations came to nothing. It appears that Gildo demanded that Libya should be consigned to his rule, and he certainly took possession of it. It also appears that embassies on the subject passed between Italy and Constantinople, and that Symmachus the orator was one of the ambassadors. But it is certain that Arcadius did not in any way assist Gildo, and the comparatively slight and moderate references which the hostile Claudius makes to the hesitating attitude of New Rome indicate that the government of Alexandrius did not behave very badly after all. We need not go into the details of the Gildonic War, through which Stilicho won well-deserved laurels, although he did not take the field himself. What made the revolt of the Count of Africa of such great moment was the fact that the African provinces were the granary of Old Rome, as Egypt was the granary of New Rome. By stopping the supplies of corn, Gildo might hope to starve out Italy. The prompt action and efficient management of Stilicho, however, prevented any catastrophe, for ships from Gaul and from Spain laden with corn appeared in the Tiber, and Rome was supplied during the winter months. Early in 398 a fleet sailed against the tyrant, whose hideous cruelties and oppressions were worthy of his Moorish blood and it is a curious fact that this fleet was under the command of Meshezel, Gildo's brother, who was now playing the same part toward Gildo that Gildo had played towards his brother Firmus. The undisciplined nomadic army of the rebel was scattered without labour at Ardalio, and Africa was delivered from the Moors' reign of ruin and terror, to which Roman rule, with all its fiscal sternness, was peace and prosperity. The subjugation of the man whom the Senate of Old Rome had pronounced a public enemy redounded far and wide to the glory of the man whom the Senate of New Rome had proclaimed a public enemy, and in the meantime Stilicho's position had become still more splendid and secure by the marriage of his daughter Maria with the Emperor Honorius, 398, for which an epithalamium was written by Claudian, who, as we might expect, celebrates the father-in-law as expressly as the bridal pair. The Gildonic War also supplied, we need hardly remark, a grateful material for his favourite theme and the year 400, to which Stilicho gave his name of consul, inspired an enthusiastic effusion. It may seem strange that now, almost at the zenith of his fame, the father-in-law of the emperor and the hero of the Gildonic War did not make some attempt to carry out his favourite project of interfering with the government of the eastern provinces, but there are two considerations which may help to explain this. In the first place, Stilicho himself was not the man of indomitable will who forms a project and carries it through, who was a man rather of that ambitious but hesitating character which Momsen attributes to Pompey. He was half a Roman and half a barbarian. He was half strong and half weak. He was half patriotic and half selfish. His intentions were unscrupulous, but he was almost afraid of them. Besides this, his wife, Serena, probably endeavoured to check his policy of discord and maintain unity in the Theodosian house. In the second place, it is sufficiently probable that he was in constant communication with Gainus the German general of the Eastern armies and chief representative of the German interests in the realm of Arcadius, and that Gainus was awaiting his time for an outbreak, by which Stilicho hoped to profit and execute his designs. He had no excuse for interference, and he was willing to wait. 
His inactive policy of the next two years must not be taken to indicate that he cherished no ambitious projects. The Germans looked up to Stilicho as the most important German in the Empire, their natural protector and friend, while there was a large Roman faction opposed to him as a foreigner. But as yet this faction was not strong enough to overpower him. It is remarkable that his fall was finally brought about by the influence of a palace official, AD 408, while the fall of his rival Eutropius, which occurred far sooner, AD 399, was brought about by the compulsion of a German general. These facts indicate that the two dangers to which I have already called attention, the preponderating influence of chamberlains and eunuchs, were mutually checks on each other. End of section 38. Recording by Squeaky.